image here was covered with trees. And any of you who have tried to dig in the soil around here know that it's clay. <laughs> it what didn't make really great farmland. Some people made some success on it, but most people who came in here and tried to farm, they really were diligent farmers, they moved on to something else. So we, we didn't remain much of a farming community other than a few up here on the northwest side for very long. Now this area down here called Ludemans, in 1873, oops, uh, things began to change. And this is part of what started to change was the trains came through. And they came along the line that we now know as the Oak Ridge Tail over on the, on the far west side of the village. Um, that train came, it started uh, in Chicago, slowly working its way north. So that by 1873, they could run it through here, and it went all the way up to Fond du Lac. This picture was taken <coughs> later. This is after the turn of the 20th century. But uh, it did follow the tracks as we know them today, but it also had a second track. And you can sort of see it going off right here. Uh, any of you live on the Ardmore area, in Ardmore Wildwood? Yeah, this track went up straight through what we now know as Ardmore and Wildwood streets and went to Sheboygan. So there were two tracks. One went to Pond Black and the other one went to Sheboygan. Um, Having the train coming into this area made it possible, first of all, for people who live here to get into the city of Milwaukee in some way other than by a boat or by a plane. Um, but it also made it possible for some industry to come in. This little station, this picture would have been taken in, uh, in about 1920. By that time, we were called Sherwood. Before that, the train left station was called Shore Line before we changed our name. It was 1970, wasn't it? 1970, we changed our name. This little girl, whoops. This picture um, was taken by our, what we call our benefactor, who is Mr. Sheldon, who took most of the pictures in Sherwood in the 1920s. And we can always tell they're his pictures because his daughter's in all of them. And we can figure out when they were taken by how big Mary was, because she was born in about 1917. So this looks like she's been four or five at this one. So we had the train, we had a station, so it was there for, for uh, people who rode the train, as well as for some commerce, which began to develop. One of the things that developed in a big way was cement. Developed the taking cement, taking the limestone out of the river and uh, the shoreline of the river to make cement. It turned out to be just exactly what was needed for to make cement at that time. It's before Portland cement. And the first cement mill was located on our side of the river. And if you're going uh, west on Congress and you get to Wilson Drive and then the park right over there, that's where the mill was. And um, the train, of course, came up right beside that so that they had the access to the train to get rid of their stuff. But it was a pretty big operation. We've read that this, along with two other mills that were along the river, employed as many as 80 people uh, in very hard work, <laughs> digging that rock out of the river um, and then grinding it up and smelting it and getting it ready to ship out. Uh, some of the cement from here went as far north as, as the uh, Mackinac Bridge. Uh, a lot of it went south into the St. Louis area, but it was one of the biggest providers of cement at the time. And they were there from about um, 18, it was 96 until 1909, or 1886 until 1909. Uh, at which point the way they made cement changed and the place closed. If you were walking over by the river and you go down on the path below the park, Mr. Brook Park, and look up, you'll just see all that limestone. You can also generally find little um, uh, shells and things that are still there because it's a, it was a, just a really interesting rock area. This was the other mill that was across the river, approximately behind WTMJ. Now, in fact, that part, big parking lot behind there on the other side. And I'm, we've seen a lot of pictures of these mills. I mean, it's still a mystery to me just exactly how they work, but I have been told that they took, they took the rock out of the river as well as out of the sides. So it was a a pretty good operation. In 1900, uh, as I said, we had been part of the town of Milwaukee, but in 1900, a few people who lived around here, there's about 300, um, decided that they really wanted their streets paved. And they were upset with the town of Milwaukee because none of the tax money that they were paying seemed to come back to this area at all. So a group of them got together in what was known as Pete Mead's Tavern, which is this one. These were actually there are two big taverns here. What's but this is Lower Oakland. Oakland. Uh, this is Oakland Avenue, up um, about, um, this would be close to Newton. So Menlo, Newton, you're up getting close to the top of the hill. Um, got together 
organized, decided they were going to incorporate, went to the county, and said, can we please do this? City of Milwaukee and town of Milwaukee weren't too pleased, but they said, you don't have enough people, so they had to go back, <coughs> take a census. Yes, they had 300 people, so they could incorporate. And they incorporated as the uh, city or village of East Milwaukee, which is a real original name. But anyway, they got what they wanted in terms of having the taxes come in. As you can see, this picture was actually taken in 1917. Uh, we already have um, the tracks for the for the uh, trolley cars running up the street. Um, this street doesn't look like it went terribly muddy. It had some kind of paving with it, obviously, but uh, you also still have a place to put your horses on if you need to. So um, things have changed quite a bit along that area since that time. <laughs> right across the street from this, over here, is where Mr. Ludeman had his farm. And again, to go backwards, in 1873, Mr. Luderman decided he was going to put some park benches and some picnic tables in his farmland, just a few, and invite people who came up the river to come and pay him some money to have picnic on his farm on Sunday afternoons. The river was a huge source of recreation for Milwaukee in the late 19th century. Uh, people wanted to get out of the city, they got the water, it was obviously easier than going on Lake Michigan. Uh, the river was higher then, so it was more boating, um, and uh, they would come north, sometimes even on little steamboats, come up to this area, so they would go to Ludeman's and have a picnic. Well, Ludeman's only lasted for one year, I'm not sure just why it changed so often, but um, it was replaced by a group they called the place Mineral Springs Park. And this was owned by a, a very interesting man named Mr. Zweitrush, who was um, uh, an expert about bubbled water. <laughs> and he discovered springs on the parkland and bottled it, called it Apollo water. So he didn't buy people to come to this park where he made it much nicer. He planted a lot of trees, made it part of a hotel, uh, have people come out on the weekends, walk the trails, walk along the river, and drink his water. Of course, probably some beer too. Um, so they never really referred to it as a beer garden, but it was just a nice place for families to get out of the city um, on, on Saturday <coughs> or Sunday afternoon. And again, they often would come by the river, uh, by boat, get off, and what we now know is Hubbard Park, come up through those tunnels, which were already in place, and into the park. Um, it was a pretty going concern for 10 or 15 years, and then started to peter off. And then it was replaced with an amusement park. In 1900, the land was purchased from Mr. Zweitrich by uh, a man who was big on amusement parks, wanted to do one here in, in Shorewood because in 1893, at the um, World's Exposition, World's Fair Exhibition in Chicago, the Ferris wheel was introduced, and people were nuts about the Ferris wheels. So Coney Island in New York had already started up at this point. The gentleman came here and said, let's have our own Coney Island. So he developed this amusement park that had a Ferris wheel, it had all kinds of different rides, it had a, um, a fun house, it had acts that came in, there were clowns, they even had some animals. And the first one was called Coney Island and he lasted for about three years. You couldn't make a living at it. You think about it, they had about 14 weeks out of the year that they could be open and that probably on weekends, so you really had to get a lot of people to come in here on weekends. So it was closed a couple of years and then opened again as Wonderland. And this was the entrance, and this entrance would have been um, right about to the corner, then low, <coughs> then low and open. Um, and people would come in, and they usually they could come in for free, but then they'd have to pay like five or 10 cents for the rides. Um, the people who did Wonderland added a big, um, they called it, see, it had, um, roller coaster, big wood, wooden roller coaster. Uh, and this big uh, just light, the tower of light, that could be seen from a long, long way away. Uh, but people would have to pay for their rides, they'd pay for their food, they maybe pay to come up on the, on the trolley car. So that if they figured it cost an average family about $5 to come for the day, which at that time was quite a bit of money. So people probably only came once a summer. Consequently, when they went to money, either. so um, they were around for about three years. And then it closed again. And the third time it was opened up as Ravenna. Took another name, didn't add anything to it, just changed the name. And these people were somewhat successful. I'm not sure exactly what they did different other than they didn't put a whole lot of money into it. Um, but they brought in some of the circus acts, the highway acts, that kind of thing. But if you, you, know, you got to think about this. This is the area from Edgewood on the south, north to about uh, Newton, and then from Oakland to the river. Pretty good sized piece of property. 
Um, and it was quite literally almost totally covered with the with this ride. The um, last picture I'll show you just that. This was one of like, like a dance hall, music hall, it's on the property. Isn't that pretty? And this is the overview. Um, this is the river back here and the train tracks. So this is the 20s? This, no, this is still about, um, this is Wonderland, so this is between 1905 and 1907. Yeah, it says copyright 1906 by Wisconsin. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oak stuff or other. Um, and it's a hand-colored hand postcard, so it's a pretty old one. Um, that building we just saw, I think, is this one. Uh, this was the roller coaster, a wooden roller coaster. It must have made a horrendous amount of noise. Um, this was called the Shoots to Shoots. It was kind of a boat type of thing. It came down here and landed in the pool. Um, the fun houses and the clowns and the mazes and restaurants and things were over along this area. It was huge. It's just, it's truly hard to imagine. And um, this year, our historical society is really focusing on that corner of the village. And one of the things that we're doing that we hope will help people to understand it better is we've got some of the uh, intermediate school kids working on making, um, using 3D printers and trying to recreate our amusement park for us, something we'll be able to display at the library and other places. So uh, you can look at it flat, but we just thought we could do something that would give it a little more depth. It might make more sense to people. It was a fun place. So as Ravenna, it lasted until 1915. That was the end of the, the amusement parks. And the problem at that point was the community was growing around them. And there was housing now in two or three sides. Um, and the people who were moving in here weren't too thrilled with the people who came to the amusement parks. And they were uh, yeah, cavorting on the Oakland Avenue and making altogether too much noise. Um, there were a lot of things going on in those bars too. They probably weren't quite as delightful as we would have liked at this time. So, the village at that point said, we're not going to renew your license. And so that ended the amusement parks. So moving on to a couple other things that were unique to Sherwood. One was the armory. This is a National Guard armory. It was um, on the northwest corner of Capitol and Oakland, um, about where the Light Horse building is right now. That's where they got the name. Um, it was a big, big, uh, uh, red brick building that handled these light horses. Obviously, they were on, on horseback squadron. Um, they used to entertain people on Sunday afternoons by having parades with their horses down Oakland Avenue. Um, and there's, that really was about all that was on that corner. This was the commandant's house over here. And we read they used to take their horses down to water them down Olive Street going towards the river. And that's some more springs. I think there's a lot of springs around here. So they, uh, um, we were a very colorful group here until the mid-20s, at which time they merged with what is now the Richard Street Armory. And this one was closed. And the village acquired the property in the building. And when this building was torn down, a lot of the brick ended up in Hubbard Lodge. So we repurposed even at that point in time, which is kind of cool. This is on 1918 map. This is just after we changed our name to Charlotte in 1917. And Kind of realizing we were growing up as something that was unique and different from Milwaukee. Um, we were done with the amusement parks. We were becoming a community, residential community. We needed a new name, so we became Shorewood. But you can see that in 1918, there was still practically nothing over here. Because this would be Oakland running down here. Um, the train tracks still ran both ways. One here. This was the one to, to uh, Sheboygan. This is the one to Fond du Lac. Um, just beginning to get a little bit of development up here in the north end. Uh, this is the uh, armory that I just showed you. And where the amusement parks were, which was this basically almost all of this area, they're now down here in the southern end was a car barn, which was a place for the um, trolleys to come, the electric trolleys. And that was their starting point running both north and south. It was a huge one. Um, that's, they'd go in and they would fix them there and they would wash them and they would park them there until they were going in the next run. And they had a really lovely little building right here in the corner that was you know, used for both people who were trying to transfer between buses to stop there, but also for the train. And they had their own doctor and they had a party room. And we, we still have uh, people around here whose parents worked there. They were going to Christmas parties in the train. That's really 
Um, they were very, um, it's a really strong brotherhood. The word brotherhood is often used for these drivers of these, these trailers. And the people who are still interested in those trolleys and, and their history, whether we're after that, they are very committed. Yes? I have a question, two questions. First yeah. of all, is it an urban legend? I don't know if the, the dog park in Estherbrook Park, I have been uh -huh. told, is built on a former landfill. Um, uh, I don't know if it was landfill so much as there used to be a place there where we took, took a, um, you know, like when we chopped up our Christmas trees and various other trees, there was a huge pile of mulch over there. Okay. We used to take our kids there in the wintertime because they would, the birds would be all over because it was warm. And you, you know, the heat was coming out of the pile. It was a huge pile, but that was there for sure. Mm -hmm. And that was as late as the 70s. And my other question is, is there anything interesting about the little zigzag up there at the top that the border didn't just go down Glendale straight across? It goes in the theory. Of block. My theory. <laughs> and it's totally my theory. Whitefish Bay incorporated before we did. They also need to be interested people to do it. <laughs> and if you go back and look at some of the early farm maps, you can see, you know, there were farms that kind of fit here. I think they just grabbed some of this land to get their 300 people. Uh, they also incorporated.